This is a Flipping Junkie Podcast, episode 32. Welcome to the Flipping Junkie Podcast. My name is Danny Johnson, former software developer turned house flipper, flipping hundreds of houses. Each week, we bring you interviews, strategies, stories, and motivation to help you get started flipping houses and on your way to becoming your own boss and achieving financial freedom. Thanks for spending time with me today. Now let's get to it. Hey, thanks for joining us again for the Flipping Junkie Podcast. Today, I've got my good friend Andy McFarland on the show to talk about how to work with wholesalers. Andy knows a thing or two about wholesaling. He's a self-made real estate entrepreneur, started with nothing, currently makes seven figures a year in his real estate investing business. He currently focuses on wholesaling in three different states, Utah, New Mexico, and Indiana. And in 2015 alone, Andy did over 150 deals. So like I said, he knows a thing about or two about wholesaling and we'll be speaking with him and uh, learning as much as we can from him today on the episode. We're going to talk about how to uh, find the best wholesalers, how to work with them, and um, you know, do what we can to get them to give us a call with the greatest deals before they blast them out to everybody else. So we're going to get into all the good stuff with this episode, so stay tuned. Uh, also, please check out our real estate investing websites at leadpropeller.com. Those websites are websites that I've built and uh, set up that do a lot of great things uh, using all the knowledge that I've learned uh, over the last over 10 years of uh, getting thousands of leads, uh, motivated seller leads off the internet for my house flipping business. And a lot of that is built into Lead Propeller. So you'd hit the ground running with one of those websites. Check it out, leadpropeller.com. Also, we just came out of beta for reimobile.com. And that's a web application for real estate investors. Basically keeps track of all your leads, set up... Uh, uh, follow-up reminders and do deal analysis, all that kind of stuff. So check it out, rimobile.com. And if you have any questions about either of those software systems, you know, the websites or the CRM system, you can give us a call at 210-999-5187. That's 210-999-5187. Somebody here in my office will answer that uh, no, that number and answer any questions that you have about those systems. So feel free to give us a call. And uh, let's uh, go ahead and get into the episode. Thanks for being on the show again. Yeah, no worries. I'm glad I could be on a second time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, episode 19. For anybody who wants to see the show notes, go to flippingjunkie.com slash 19, where we talked about how much do you really need to know before taking action, getting started flipping houses. But uh, so how you been since, I guess it's only been a couple months. Yeah, it's only been a few months. Yeah. Um, life's been good, busy. Uh, the real estate world's been insane. We've had bigger volume the last two months than we've than I've ever had. So it's been it's been good. That's awesome. So still growing. Still growing. Yeah, we did twenty six deals in uh, uh, March, and we've got I think twenty four right now in April. Nice. So, yeah, that's a lot. And you're doing strictly wholesaling. Um, I I do about four four of those a month. I'll flip them myself, but the majority of those is is wholesale. Yeah. Nice, nice. So how is, uh, and then you're doing I Love Real Estate Stories YouTube channel. Yep, that YouTube channel with the little project with my brother. Older brother, we get in and tell a story every week, kind of documentary film style. And my brother does a really good job with that. And I'm just the guy in front of the camera, but he's the guy making the magic happen behind the camera in the editing room. So that's, yeah. a, that's a fun project. Yeah, I love it. It's a great thing. Everybody should check it out. It's I Love Real Estate Stories dot com, right? Yep. Or you can go to YouTube and just plug in I Love Real Estate Stories or Andy McFarland and It'll pop up, and we appreciate any comments, any subscriptions, and yeah. all free. And check it out because he actually has one with me on it where I, I flew up and met with Andy, hung out with him, and he recorded. So if you want to see a jittery me on camera, <laughs> then go ahead and check it out. But it, it was a good. Jittery. <laughs> it was good. Yeah, it was good. I'm not used to being on camera, just audio stuff. But all right, well, let's just get right into this episode. We're going to talk about. Um, you know, how to work with wholesales. I think everybody should not only have, you know, a real estate attorney, uh, closer, title company, you know, all that kind of stuff, agent that they work with, but also wholesalers because it's a great source of deals. And uh, you want to first explain maybe exactly how wholesalers operate? Yeah, sure. Um, wholesalers operate in kind of varying degrees. You've got like the beginning wholesalers and the more experienced wholesalers and everything in between. But most people start in real estate, they'll say they're a wholesaler. If they go out there and try to find a property, put it under contract, 
and then sell that contract to somebody else, sell that opportunity to somebody else. So that's wholesaling in a nutshell. You know, get it under contract for less and try to sell it for a little bit more. That's right. pretty much it. And so what we're talking about is being on the side of it that you're buying it from that investor as is. They can make some profit and then you have a deal that you could fix up and flip and make a big profit. Yeah. Yeah, buying from wholesalers, and I've said this to people for years, that it's, it's the easiest way to get into this business, really. Now, with the caveat, you need to be careful. You need to know your numbers. You need to know whether or not it's a deal, be able to evaluate the deal. But buying it from somebody that's gone and found the deal for you, what easier way to go and, and find deals, right? Look at a deal. So for sure, that's a great way to buy properties. Right. And I think the reason why some people just shy away from it, and I, I did for a long time, honestly, myself, is because there's a common misperception. Is it misperception or misconception? Either way, that the yeah. deals... <laughs> The deals are too thin if you buy from a wholesaler. Like they're, they're, There's not enough meat on the bone, I think, is what the typical phrase is that people use or have in their head. And I'm sure, I'm sure that you don't believe it. I now don't believe it. But I guess there's a difference, though, in the deals that most people see that come across their desk or that they get in their emails than the ones actually being sold without those mass emails. I mean, do you think that's true? Uh, yeah, I think that's true. And that, that misconception you said there, I think it's absolutely true. So when I mentioned earlier in saying that there's – newer wholesalers and there's more experienced wholesalers. As wholesalers get more experienced, part of that being more experienced is they've got a better buyer's list. And with a better buyer's list, they can command more money. So what somebody might view through their email or just if they talk to a wholesaler and the guy shows them a deal and they don't think it's a deal, it might be because it doesn't work for them. But um, so my advice to to people would be is don't necessarily think that about all wholesale deals because that's not necessarily true. Um, But you know, look at it and think, okay, why is this a deal? Why is this not a deal? Don't begin, but just, just, I mean, just to cut to the chase, because I've heard that a lot before, experienced wholesalers get more money for the deals, period. And if you're on an email list of an experienced wholesaler that's got thousands of people on his list, yeah, you're probably not going to get a phenomenal deal right there. But there are ways to kind of get around that. What you want to do is find people who are maybe the less experienced wholesalers that haven't been doing it as long, that don't have as many buyers, and you can go talk to them and build a relationship with them. And if you can kind of stay on the top of their mind, you can absolutely get even better deals from them. I mean, experienced wholesalers will give you a deal too. But the people that are less experienced, when they find a deal, you can get an even better deal from them. So don't write off all wholesalers like, oh, that doesn't work. That's not true. That's not yeah, true. and you make a fantastic point that I think could easily be missed in, in what you just said. And you said be top of mind with them. And yeah. I think that's completely key because people say, well, I've talked to them. I called, you know, 10 wholesalers and they didn't send me stuff. I just still get everything blasted out in an email. And it's like, well, how often did you talk to them? Yeah. Well, I called them the once. Well, you're not going to be top of mind. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So, so how do you be top of mind? You know, I see you be top of mind with somebody. Note them that they're actually doing something and just follow up with them relatively frequently. I'd say on a weekly basis is probably about as frequent as you'd need to be. Um, emails, texts, phone calls every once in a while, and don't be so blatantly just like grabby as like give me, give me, give me. Call them up and say, talk to them about whatever you talked about before. If they were into sports or if they were into you know, whatever they're into, just that, wherever you built that rapport with them on, talk to them about that so you can show them that you're being genuine. Don't always just ask them for deals, but then just say, hey, what are you, what are you working on? Do you have any deals right now? Or is there anything in the pipeline that's coming up soon that, that you might be able to show me? And they're going to tell you what they've got if you ask them that way. Yeah, and that goes a long way because I I get calls all the time too. People like send me some deals. You have any deals and stuff like that. But it, when you call like that, you're just with everybody else. You're with the hundred other people that called over the last couple months, saying the same exact thing. But the guy that stops and says, "Hey, you know, I want to talk with you about you know flipping houses. I know you're busy. Let's just go have coffee for thirty minutes, you know, or something close to your office, so you don't have to go very far. Or I'll come to your office, you know, just to to talk and chat. And it, it just goes a long way, and you do stand out. So it's yeah. not, as, not as hard as you might think. And when you ask them about that and you find out about a deal, even the experienced wholesalers, they'll, they'll slip a little bit and they'll tell you when they've got a deal coming up. And if you're the first one to know about that, then the, next, then the next thing is it's not about what's in it for you. You don't say, hey, give me that deal, give me that deal. Ask them like, hey, look, how can I make your life easy with this? What's going on with this deal? Yeah. When does this need to close? And people, as from, a, from an experienced wholesaler's perspective, the problem with most people are they want to be at the top of my buyer's list yet they probably don't have money, they don't really know what a deal is and they can't perform. So they want me to give them a deal. And I look at this and say, look, one, you're not gonna pay the most, and two, I don't even know that you're gonna perform, you've got no history. So think to yourself, put yourself in their shoes. You want, they want the deal to be made easy on their side. So 
what can you do to help make it fast and easy for them? Be ready with your money. Be ready with your due diligence so you know that you can pull the trigger and just say yes, make your life easy. So I've got a story about this. I've, so I'm a wholesaler but I also buy from, from wholesalers as well. Um, in fact, I did a co-wholesale deal like this, this week that I made money on, right? I just linked up with a newer wholesaler. He brought it to me and I used my list and I double closed it. I funded it. I made his life easy, right? Nice. He got another house under contract so we're actually going to do that again, right? So he just doesn't want to deal with it. He doesn't have the money to close it. He doesn't have the buyer's list I've got so we're going to split the profits on that one too. But um, besides co-wholesale deals, I got I had a guy that sent an email out. He's just a newer wholesaler. He didn't have a ton of people on his list and I was a guy that he knew. He sent an email out and I was kind of surprised he didn't just call me directly. But I saw the email like within 20 minutes of sending it. I recognized it was a deal because what? I'd done my research. I knew my market. I knew this was a, a good deal and I watched, looked at his pictures and saw the video and I'm like, yeah, this is a deal. So I called him up immediately and I said, hey, you sent this email. I'm like, why didn't you call me? He said, oh, I didn't think you'd be interested in this deal because in his mind he thought I was I wasn't into rental properties, and for some reason he thought this was a rental property, which hmm. was like this was absolutely it could have been <laughs> rental, but it was like it was a total flip opportunity. So I said, "No, I'm, I'm interested in that." And I said, "Is there anybody else on this?" He said, "Yeah, I've had a few phone calls, and there's people driving out to the property right now." So I made his life easy. You know what I said? I said, "I'll take it. I'm done. I'll take it." He's like, "You haven't seen it yet, Andy?" I said, "I know. I'm good. I'll take it." And he's like, "Okay, well, sure, it's yours." I was the first one to say, I'll take it. So the other people that are out there driving it, let's go look at the property, go kick the tires. It's already sold. Out. It was already yeah. sold. It was my deal. So I bought it from him, right? Kind of sight unseen, but I'd seen the pictures and I had enough experience um, with the area and stuff that I knew that it was just a deal. So I bought it and I actually turned, I bought it from him and I turned around and wholesaled it for $15,000 more to a guy who actually recently sold that property too. But but that's just a way like people say, well, how am I going to get the deals from the wholesalers? You got to sometimes be aggressive. Have mm -hmm. your money in place. Have your research done and just be the guy that's going to take a, a little leap sometimes. And again, don't, don't misread that. Don't do it irresponsibly. But sometimes you just have to be the first one to jump and make that wholesaler's life easy. Because I say when I used to be – when I was a little bit of a less experienced wholesaler, when I'd get a deal, I, I just wanted to get rid of the deal. It was like a hot potato in my hands, right? I was like I got a deal signed up. I was excited. And then the next thing is like, okay, who am I going to sell this to? And the first person that calls me, I'm excited. I'll talk about it. And if they said to me, great, tell you what. I'll close it next week with cash. You're done. You're going to put 10 grand in your pocket. What do you think? I think, well, I'm done. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Done. I'll sell it. And I've sold so many deals that way because I'm a human being and everybody, all of you guys, you're the same way. You just want that certainty. So do that for wholesalers. Be on the top of their mind. And when they have a deal, have your research done, make their life easy and give them certainty. Give them certainty. Now, one way to screw up that deal is say, yeah, I think I want to buy it, but can I go look at it? I want to talk to a bunch of people and then I'm going to talk to my lender and see if he'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Not interested, you know. Right. And you might not be at that stage yet in your vesting, but you need to know that that's where you need to be. And that, and that's for anything. That's not just wholesaling. That's for anything. Listed properties, other deals, motivated sellers calling you. You just have to be ready. If you're not ready, you know, it's really hard to get the really good deals. Yeah, absolutely. They're that's, gonna pass pass you right by. That's a good summary. Just be ready. Be ready and make the person's life easy and that goes a long way. Right. And you, you said something in there again too that I think is a big uh, a point you talked about the wholesaler that you bought from uh you know sight unseen was thinking it was more of a rental property so you wouldn't be interested i think a lot of times even if it's an experienced wholesaler that's pushing out an email to a bunch of people he might have read the property a little bit wrong in a hurry or something put wrong values um and other people are going to see those values and think oh that's not a deal i'm interested in you know, those numbers that you see come across might not always be right. You need to check and do the due diligence because it could err on your favor where everybody's passing it up, but it's really a deal. That's absolutely true because you don't assume. Yeah, don't assume. Look at those deals. Oh, here's another kink. So like Danny said, that's so true. Don't assume. Look at your own ARV. Look at your own repairs because the wholesaler that sent it out might be looking at through the lens of a buy and hold or through the lens of a flip and you're a buy and hold person. So don't assume that it is or it isn't a deal. Verify those facts. Um, yeah, that's that's extremely key there. And by and by the way, when you when you see an email come across from these wholesalers, and it's the price that you say, and everybody says this, right? It's like the oh, these wholesalers are always selling it for more. They're always asking more. Well, yeah, we're capitalists, right? So we're trying to maximize and do the best we can for our companies. But that doesn't mean you can't make an offer. So there's it's it's a fraction of the people that we send an email to that actually make an offer, which is interesting to me. If it's something out there, I'm a wholesaler. I've got a property. You might not like my numbers. But why don't you just reply back simply and say, if you've done your research, you spent 10 minutes looking at it, come back and say, 110 doesn't work for me, but I'll buy it for 95. 
that's it. Let me know because you never know. I might come back and say, you know, start countering you and negotiating with you. So I think you always let people know where you will buy the property. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I think most people are going to ask for more than they hope to get. Yeah. And so, you know, yeah, it does yeah, negotiate. Why not negotiate with the with the wholesaler? Yeah. So I how think, do you go ahead? Um along that line, whenever we send out an email cuz right now I'm I'm an experienced wholesaler, I'd say. I do quite a few wholesales every month. And depending on the state, and I do it in three different states, so depending on the state, I know if I've got more or less strong buyers. And depending on the area that I get the property in within that state, I know if it's got more or less strong buyers that will buy in that area. But by and large, we always send it out a little bit more than we think. Because there's sometimes it happens we'll send it out where we think it's a good price or like a, a price where you might be pushing a little bit and somebody will snap it up quickly and we left money on the table. So our responsibility, this is a peak behind an experienced wholesaler, right guys? Our responsibility is to push it a little bit. Sometimes we push it. And uh, you know that means that we're willing to come off the price a little bit sometimes. So just don't assume that that's the price that won't get negotiated. Right, right. So how do you find the best wholesalers to spend the time sort of courting and uh, trying to build relationships with? Oh, that's a brilliant question. Here's the great filter for all you guys. This is this is worth this is gold to you guys. Okay, great wholesalers are people who do things actively to find properties. So when you're at a RIA luncheon or a, a any place where there's real estate investors and you meet somebody for the first time and he says, "I am a wholesaler," that's great. The follow up question is, "What are you doing?" So tell me, what your wholesaler? What do you do to find these properties? And if they if they say, well, I, I'm just new, I'm just getting started, I'm just looking for properties, and they don't have any answer for that, you might want to kind of scratch them off your list. You don't really need to follow up with them, probably. But if they say, well, I'm new to the wholesaling, but I've started sending out a bunch of mailers, I put up bandit signs, and I've got a little lead propeller website that I just put up. Okay, what do I know about that person? Even though he's new, he's doing things that are probable that that are going to bring him a deal. So I want to follow up with that guy. I definitely want to follow up with that guy. But if he doesn't say he's doing anything, taking any action. You don't really follow up with them. But if you have a list of people who are doing things and taking action, they will find deals. You just need to be at the top of their mind when they find those deals. Right. So those are great questions because really that's what it's all about. Wholesalers have to be master marketers. Yeah. Hey, let me give you this this example. This co-wholesale deal I just did. Okay. This is a newer investor who I've known for a couple of years. And this is a good note for you guys too. Always be genuine and friendly with everybody because you never know. You never know who's going to end up being a guy and who's, who's going to be somebody that's not going to take the action. So I've known him for a few years. I've always given him that time. I've never blown him off. I, I talk to him and give him free advice, right? And he started sending mail, and he doesn't he doesn't know anything. He's a new new investor, and that's fine. He started sending mail uh, and you know fail on his way through this, and he found somebody. He negotiated. And he got it. Got a property under contract, right? So who does he call first? He called me because he has no idea. He's scared to death. In fact, he uses my contract. He called me before he signed it up and said, what should I say here and there? And I, I walked him through it. He got it signed up and I looked at it and I was like, wow, it's actually a deal. <laughs> you know, yeah. you're kind of surprised. It's actually a deal. So he brought it to me first. So I said, look, here's what we're gonna do with it. I'll send it out. Uh, we'll, we'll split the profits. And he was just ecstatic with that. And that's what we did. And then he found another one, right? So if you help people along the way, um, you know, let them take that action, do the stuff, and just be fair with them, and it can be a, a good relationship. So yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, I I used to um, pretty much write off people that would call and ask what, you know, tell me they were a new investor and they want to find out what kind of buy cr- uh, buying criteria I have. Yeah. And I would just be like, oh, you know, I'm busy. I don't I don't have time. You know, I'll just anything in San Antonio, right? Yeah. Like whatever it is, I'll buy it. You know, just send it to me. And that doesn't go a long way because you don't talk to them much and build, you know, they just kind of forget you or think that you were being a little bit rude. But, you know, if you get a ton of those calls, you, it starts to be a kind of a, a pain and you should have somebody else field those calls for you. would be the smart thing to do. But, but uh, you know, the better thing to do, like Andy was talking about, is to say, you know, especially if they're newer investors, newer wholesalers or just investors in general, if they're nervous about, uh, you know, what to offer, how to analyze a deal, all that kind of stuff but they're actively marketing and getting leads, you offer to help them determine what to offer. So if they get a great lead and somebody's super motivated and they don't know what to do, they're freaking out, they call you, you go and help them and say, look, I'll buy it from you for this. Offer whatever you want below that and it's yours. That's your wholesale fee. Yep. And that goes a long way. And this same guy that I worked this one with, we closed it on Monday, just a few days ago. 
he uh, he told me when we were leaving title, that was his first one. And he was so nervous there. And some of you guys that are experienced investors listening, it's hard to remember how nervous you were on your first one. And you were, you know, was this real? Is this going to happen? But he got his check. And I think he made $12,000. And he was so excited because it was real at that point. I could see the excitement in his eyes. And he said, wow, this is awesome because he was doing mailers and stuff. And he said, I've got some other people i got to go through. And he's like, there's a few people that are probable here. This person, I'm going to call him back today. And he said, in fact, what do you think about this? And he told me a little bit about the property. And I said, well, here's what I think. I think you probably need to be around right here. I said, let me know when you, when you, when you work that out. Well, lo and behold, he texted me like yesterday. And he says, I got this one under contract. He's nice. like, let's, let's do it again. So I'm like, cool. Linking up the walkthrough video. We're going to shoot it out to our list. We're going to split the whole selfie. And I know we're going to be able to make money on that one too. And he's happy about it. And of course, I'm happy about it because from a little bit of help over the years, now I've got you know, $12,000 I made on the one deal or this week. And I'll probably make another 10000 on this one. So that's the best marketing money ever, right? I didn't have to spend any. I just had to help him a little bit. Yeah, heck yeah. All right. Do you have any tips on how to gain the favor of good wholesalers, though, so that they call you first? Other than being top of mind, is there is there something else? And I think you touched a little bit on on that before as far as being prepared, but any, any other kind of tips? Yeah, I would say if they're a wholesaler that you really want to get in their good graces and they're serious and they're player and they're, they're going to be in this market for a while, I think at some point you might have to maybe do a deal that you don't necessarily want to do. Now, don't do a deal that's going to lose money, but maybe loosen your criteria a little bit and just step in there because I want to know that you're actually going to perform. I mean, so when my disposition guy calls me up and we've, we've got somebody we're working with or a few different offers and we've worked with one before and the other one is, is a have we haven't worked with them before? We're always going to err on the side that we've worked with before. These clothes from us, we know him. He's kind of a known quantity to us. So sometimes it takes just getting in there and actually doing one. So we actually respect you and know who you are. Because a lot of people that kick the tires and walk around the stuff. The people actually close and perform. And then when you close and perform, there's a difference too. There was somebody that bought our whole, a wholesale deal from us a couple of days ago. My dispositions guy was kind of griping a little bit. He said he, this guy had bought a few deals from us, but on this specific deal. He was dragging his feet and he, you know, he was supposed to close on Friday. He didn't wire his money till the following Tuesday. And our seller was getting a little bugged by that. He's like, where's my money? You know? And mm -hmm. although he wasn't backing out or anything, the seller was ticked, which came back to us because we're playing the liaison between the two. And it's like, you know, it, it made our life a little hard. So my disposition guy got a little bad feelings with our buyer now because he didn't wire the money on Friday. He wired it on Tuesday. So that little thing, he still performed, but it was like, eh, he didn't yeah. make our lives easy. So um, just do what you say you're going to do and, and, and that goes a long way. Yeah, and being ready. Yeah, and be ready. Be ready to go and, and do that. So do you have – now, you guys do a lot of deals in a lot of different places. And do you – what is your process for disposing of the properties? Do you put them under contract? you got to find a buyer for them. Uh, you're wholesaling them. What is your process? Yeah, so my process used – well, it's changed a little bit. I'll tell you how it is right now, okay? So we get a property under contract. My acquisition manager gets something under contract, brings it into the office. We take that, the office takes the contract, sends it to title. We get title pulled. We coordinate with the seller to get in there to either take pictures or, for the most part, we do a video. So we'll do a walkthrough video. And then once we decide internally how much we're going to market this property for, then we email it out. So we put it together in an email. And the email's the same format every time. It says it's coming from our company, depending on the company's different, depending on the state. I mean, same company, but, you know. And then it's got the property address. It's got all the information about the property. It's got a walkthrough video link. And then it's got instructions on the bottom of that email how somebody can get this property. Uh, and that's pretty much it. We send it out. Everybody gets to look at it. Um, and then the first person to deposit the $2,500 non-refundable earnest money and to sign our contract gets the deal. And that's the way it is now. That's, and I say that's how it is right now. How it used to be and how some less experienced wholesalers are, the ones that you probably want to talk to more, they'll, uh, they'll make a few phone calls to people first. They'll just kind of have... Uh, top couple people they'll call and when they do that they'll kind of leave money on the table because they're not you know they're not bringing it to uh, to everybody at once but so we made an internal policy that we we every time no questions asked we send out an email to everybody because we don't want to leave money on the table but again less experienced wholesalers they'll take the first person that comes along with money so yeah wow well that's interesting I didn't know that I thought that you you would maybe have those key guys that you would just give a call and have it done but so, so so what happens then if you've got one that your experienced guy, you know, let's say you put one out there, you've got it priced at 75000 A guy that you've closed a couple of properties with, bought a couple of properties from you, says, okay, I'll take it at 75000 close next week. But then you get an email from a guy you've never dealt with before and says maybe I'm hard, I got a hard money lender, and but we'll give you 80000 and close in two weeks. How do you, how do you decide on that? Um. 
if the one guy says I'll take it at 75, he signs our contract and deposits the $2,500 on front of bonus money, it's his contract. It's his deal. If he hasn't got there yet and he hasn't given us the money and signed the contract and the guy comes in and says 80, we'd probably evaluate that internally, but I would say, I would probably tell my dispositions guy, if he's going to deposit that $2,500 $2, hard earnest money, we'll wait. If, I mean, he's got to put up that hard earnest money. He's got to put the money out. If he does that, we'll wait. But if we've already got it signed and this has happened to us before, we've we've got one signed and then somebody comes and says, actually, I'll pay more. And it's, I mean, it's a done deal. We have to honor that. Right, so. right. And so that's, is that typically what you ask for is the $2,500 non-refundable? That's what we do. We tell the people to evaluate the property, look at it, see the pictures of the video. And and um, if they want it, put down the $2,500 hard earnest money. And we don't we don't let most of them through the property. Um, until they've, they put up the hard earnest money. And then we say, if you put up the hard earnest money and you walk the property, there's something materially different than what you saw in the pictures of the video. I mean, if we omitted something or the, you know, that, that they see there, then at that point would be flexible with them. But if there's nothing materially different, they just say, you know, if they come up with some excuse that's not our fault, then of course they, they lose their earnest money. Yeah, so have you ever had a, a, a time when you did have that happen where they gave the non-refundable earnest money and then went through and said, hey, this isn't what I thought? Even though it was all in the video. Yeah, that's funny. I had a, an instance like that. It's happened a few different times, but one is the most the most notable one happened a couple of years ago. Guy in my local market, um, who I kind of knew a little bit, he he did this. So I, it came my dispositions guy took the twenty five hundred, did the whole bit. bit. Um, actually, he said he was going to deposit the money. We got, signed the contract and did all the stuff. We moved forward with him, and I think he hadn't deposited it or something. I don't remember. There's something in question there, right? That he was trying to, and he came back and he said, well. Uh, actually, I don't want to do it now. And when I, I called him up, I got involved and I said, look, you said this stuff, you you committed the money, you did all these things and, and now you're backing out. And why? And he, there's the real reason was his lender wasn't going to come through. That was the real reason. And I think we didn't have his money because my dispositions guy screwed up there. He said he had the money, but he didn't have the money. So we would have just retained it, but we didn't. So I'm calling the guy up saying, look, you have to close. You have to perform in this or give us the money. And he's like, no, I'm not going to do that. And I said, basically, I said, you realize what you're doing here. I said, you're running your reputation. You're never going to buy from me again. And, and I didn't go as far as telling other people because I don't want to be that way. Yeah. So I didn't go tell on them to other investors and stuff and spread a bad reputation. But I definitely made it known. I said, you're telling me who you are right here for $2,500. You're running your reputation. Either give them the money or close the property. And he didn't. He walked away from that. And true to form, he's off our list. I'll never sell to him ever again. You know, Because right, right. he showed me who he was. So. All right. So And so I guess that doesn't happen enough you know, to be a problem, right? So it's very rare then that people will, will try to renegotiate is really what it's about. It's pretty rare that that happens. The, the only, re I guess the only reason that time happened is because we, my dispositions guy thought he was depositing the money and he didn't, and he didn't check up on it because he got busy. So when he came, when he brought the story to me, we didn't have the money. So I'm calling him up to try to get the money after the fact when he's trying to back out. So if we'd had the money, there'd have been no question. I'm like, well, see ya. But uh, he didn't want to put up the money. Right. All right. And so you said basically, that, you know, the key here is if you're a newer investor and you want to get onto somebody's list and be sort of a part of the VIP portion of their list that they call first, uh, that's that's probably the, the way to go. And, um, you know, it's all about being prepared and helping them, building that relationship. And then you'll be able to get quite a few deals. And, you know, it's pretty awesome when you think about the fact that if you had five wholesalers that you're buddies with, and even if they have a VIP list and you're not on it, but you're calling them and asking that question that Andy said is, you have anything coming up? Mm -hmm. You have something you're putting under contract right now. I don't know how many times I've done it. And you said, you know, sometimes it catches you off guard, but you still spill the beans anyway. Like I already have somebody in mind for a property I'm putting under contract to wholesale. But somebody else calls me and asks, and I don't know what it is. I can't help it. I have to tell them about it. Isn't that weird? As you know, things, somebody asks you a question, you feel like obligated to answer even though you don't have to. Right. You feel obligated to. Right. And so then I'm like, oh, well, I guess my buddy's not going to be heading over there if this guy wants it because I've already told him about it. But, yeah. but uh, you know, obviously if it's somebody I don't know, I'm not, you know. Yeah, if somebody you don't know. But if they're, if they're good enough at building rapport with you and they, and they position well enough that you feel like, okay, these guys might actually buy it. You give them that chance, and then they just like, great, I'm on it. I'm gonna do this thing. Like, you probably won't ever call. It, you won't call your friend. You, know, you just won't. Like, right. okay, well, we'll see if this guy does it. Right, they won't know. Yeah, yeah they'll never, they'll never know. But if you have that, if you build that friends list, that's what I call it, the friends list of people who are doing stuff 
um, and you call them up and shake their pockets is what I call it. Shake their pockets and say, what do you have or what do you have coming up? You will you will get deals, period, done. I tell you, that is like just market through the people you know, right? Just ask those wholesalers you know or the newbie newbie investors. They'll come up with something. And you will buy deals that way, I promise. Because I buy deals that way. I just showed you guys in this show two of them, three that are going to happen just recently that – I do that as experienced wholesalers. So there's a trick. That's how right, you right. Yeah, and you, you think about the power of it too, because if you have just even five people, you know, that you're buying from some from wholesalers, and so you're doing a bunch of marketing yourself, imagine all of the marketing combined that all you guys are doing and you're benefiting by getting these deals. Yeah. And a lot of times these newer wholesalers, you know, it's the hot potato, they want to get rid of it, but they don't have the option to to close the property or to keep it as a rental. So um, think what your advantage is if you've got some money, if you, you're willing to flip something or keep it as a rental, you do have an advantage because they don't they don't have those options. Like for me right now as the experienced wholesaler, I've got all those options. I will flip it, I will wholesale it, meaning I'll buy it and put it on the MLS. I'll keep it for my personal rental portfolio. I've got all of these options at my disposal. The newer investor, they don't have, a lot of times they don't have any of that. They're just going off of faith that if they put something under contract, they can sell it. So they need you. They need you to come and help make their life easy. Right, right. And now there's another side of this too with working with wholesalers, and that's selling through wholesalers. Now, obviously, you, you've you got a lot of experience, been doing it for a long time. You probably aren't going through other wholesalers to sell properties. But, um, you know, you had given an example earlier in this episode where you did buy one and then wholesaled it. Yeah. You know, so somebody sold to a wholesaler that wholesaled the property. So they can go down several iterations of wholesaling for the single property. Um, yeah. Now, do you have most any? Seen as, <laughs> what's, what's that? Most I've seen is five. Five. I've seen wow. it happen yeah, I was in the middle crazy. of a transaction where there was five people between the seller and the buyer. This five. That was wow. a, that was a record that I was a part of. Yeah. See, I think there was one I that I that chain. <laughs> there, there was one deal I think a, a year ago, about a year ago, I did, and I, I wholesaled it, and I made a lot of money on the wholesale, and. Um, a year later, like who I sold it to, I think, had done the rehab and sold it. And I was checking comps on another property, and I said, I'm going to see what they ended up selling that one for. Because it was when it was kind of difficult to, to gauge really what the resale value would be. And I nearly had a heart attack when I saw it because it was several hundred grand more than what I thought. And yeah. in San Antonio, that's a big difference. It like did. we just don't have very expensive properties. So, yeah, that one w- w- could have gone several iterations of wholesaling. But I... You know, I, even though I made really good money without having to touch it, you know, I still nearly had a heart attack with what, what kind of profit I could have made had I fixed it up. Sometimes that happens, like we mentioned earlier. You knowing certain areas, I mean, don't take for granted that the wholesaler knows exactly what the numbers are. When he sends out an ARV, if he puts one on there, that might not necessarily be true because there's a lot of vari- variables there. What repairs are you going to do to it? Right? Like, there's just there's so much stuff in there. That, in fact, even experience in my backyard, we've got one right now that we sent out that internally before we sent it out, we're like, we don't know. I don't know. Like there wasn't a lot of comps. It's one of those subjective areas that if it depends on what you do to it, but it's a good area. So we really didn't know. So we put a guess on it. We put our stamp on it. We sent it out and we're actually getting more than we thought, which we thought we were stretching and we're getting the highest and best thing. But you just never know. You never know what people are willing to do. So don't assume. Don't assume that, uh, that, that it's not going to go for more, right? Right. So, what kind of what kind of info do you guys do? You actually put your your um, estimated ARV and repair cost, or you let leave that all up to the. We do, and that recently I've I've thought that maybe we should rethink that, but we do. We put on there what we think it's going to take to make it a rental, and what we think it's going to make to flip it, and then also what our estimated ARV is. Um, but it's, again, it's tough because it really is very subjective. It's very subjective because when you say, you know, somebody can put twenty grand into a rehab and sell it for two hundred, and somebody might put fifty grand into it and sell it for. 260. It right. just depends on the area. Some of those areas that are hip and happening, like sometimes it's just, I call it the field of dreams. If you build it, they'll come. You know, like some of those areas are just like, to me on the level you put it, make it at, you'll be able to sell it for a lot more. Right, right. Yeah, and somebody, some people can spend twice as much as another person and get less work out of that twice budget, <laughs> double budget. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so I guess you just give a good idea of what you think it would be and, and they've got to work it out for themselves and do their due diligence. Um, so selling through wholesalers, though, I mean, if they're, you know, that's another way that we as investors can work with wholesalers. Um, 
you know, obviously the benefit there, in my opinion, is just the time savings and the hassle savings. Yeah. Because if they have a good list, they can give you a decent amount, a really good amount, and then they deal with all the hassles of getting it closed with somebody that's maybe going through hard money or whatever. Yeah. So a good example of that, I keep coming back to this one that we closed earlier this week, that a co-wholesale deal with a guy who was a newer investor. So I kind of brought him under my wing. He brought it to me first. I sent it out to my list and we sold it and we sold it for a good amount. Now, what I know is he would not have been able to find a buyer for that amount. We saw, I think the wholesale fee was about twenty four, twenty five thousand dollars. He would not have found a buyer for that much, and um, being like the circumstances required that the property be closed, so we had to do a double close. So him coming to me, not only did I take it from he had the contract, I said I'll handle it. My team sent it out. We found the buyer. We did all of the transaction coordination, and I actually funded the front transaction, and then we sold it again on the back transaction. So I brought the money to that equation too. And that's something that he probably doesn't value as much because he doesn't know. But as an experienced investor, you know that transactional funding can cost a lot of money. And because I funded it myself and bought it, I didn't have to pay for a lender's policy. I didn't have to pay for junk fees. It was very minimal fees because it was just my own money that I sent it out and brought it back. So, so I saved him money a lot of ways there. So on his own, he would not have made the $12,000 check that he made. So yeah, sometimes partnering with an experienced wholesaler can make a lot of sense. No, I agree completely. And that's why... I'd- we're having this talk in this part of the um, the podcast episode series of going from foundation mindset through who you want on your team, who you need on your team, and wholesalers is definitely, uh, they are definitely should be a part of your team. All right, so Andy, since we've got a little bit of time here, let's talk about, you know, what's what's a really good way for people that are getting started investing, building team, and all that kind of stuff, but they're saying, hey, I want to be a wholesaler myself. I've got to, I want to build a really awesome buyer's list. Do you have any tips for doing that? Yeah, so let me give you a real world example of what we've done. So I'm, I'm wholesaling in three different states now. So in my home state, I've been doing this for a long time. So I know a lot of buyers and I've got this list that's been built up over the years. So that's not fair, right? That's cheating. So let's talk about when I went to a new state. So um, a state we went into just in the last year, we went to Indiana. So we do stuff in Indianapolis, Indiana. We had no buyers there. So what we did was we went into the market and we just started networking like crazy. We weren't physically on the ground there, but we would call title companies uh, we would call real estate investors, people that had Craigslist ads, anybody and everybody would talk to them and we would put them on our list and we'd say, who do you know? Who do you know? We play that game and every investor knows a few other investors and you get them and you just put them all on your list and you call them and make that personal contact. Title companies, who are the big buyers? Who buys all this stuff, right? So we did that, just networking. Besides that, we looked up, we researched where the cash sales were and we saw who were buying multiple different properties. And we made it a point to reach out to them and find them. And if we couldn't get their phone number or know somebody that knew them, we would send them a mailer. So I actually made a video and put it on a little squeeze page. And we sent them a postcard that said something to the effect of, I know you bought a property in this area. We have one. It was like it. I've tried to reach you. Please go to this, this website. I've got a message for you. So we just sent out some postcards to people. And again, these were players, like pre-screened. We knew that they bought properties in the area we wanted to be in. So we sent it out to them, a few different postcards. And then they'd come through and, and go on our squeeze page. But... So there, and you can do a Craigslist ads, or you can do signs, you know, to find those cash buyers. Um, and we've done a little bit of that stuff, but for the most part, I would say it's brute force. I just you go in there and you just ask somebody, and who do you know, and who do you know, and you start building it slowly and surely. You build this list, and then now we're there. It's been over a year, and now we've got a legitimate buyers list. So it's not very hard because people get intimidated by that, but these buyers can't hide, right? Yeah. You got a Danny Johnson in the market who's buying a lot of properties under his under his LLC or his name or whatever. They can't hide. They're on public record. You see them out there buying stuff. So there's no fake in this stuff. So you can find them. It's just a matter of where is it recorded that they bought a property. Find out where it's recorded and then make it a point. I'm going to find this guy. This yeah. Johnson Holmes LLC. I'm going to find this guy. <laughs> That's not what it is, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it is. But you know, but then you call them, right? You just reverse search them. Like, who's, who's the owner of that? And what's the registered address? And knock on the door if you have to. But when you find somebody that's buying, if you're looking at a market and you find somebody that's bought 20 homes in the last six months, let me tell you, it's worth your time to drive around and find that person and go buy them, go buy them lunch because they're going to make your life really easy. Yeah, yeah. And you should definitely keep track of when you find people and make contact with people like that where they've got a history of buying a lot of deals, doing a lot of deals. You know they're real players, and they're they're going to be able to close and uh, act quickly. Uh, and you should always keep track of that. And I don't know if you've got a system uh, that you're using, but in REI Mobile, we have a thing where you have investors, and you can keep track of all those different things uh, so that you can rate them and sort them and have all that different kind of criteria built into it. 
oh, that's an interesting idea. So you can in a certain area, you know, if you're handpicking who you're going to, if you're right. going to shop it, you know, shop right. it to them. Right. Yeah, Which, so if you get if you if they respond to you you putting something out and then you can look and say, Oh yeah, this is one of those guys that, that bought twenty properties in the last four months. Absolutely. And you know, I, I'm gonna correct myself something I said earlier. Um we, we send out our email blast almost all of the time on properties, but there are certain instances where we will actually make phone calls and actually call specific people. And the instance would be needs to close extremely fast. If we've got like three or four days and we're going to wholesale this thing. We know that you can pick up the phone. You might not get the maximum value, but you know somebody will perform. Or we negotiate a lot of seller financing. And sometimes you're negotiating seller financing. It's a sensitive situation because you made promises to the seller. And you want to make sure whoever you assign that contract to can actually fulfill those promises. So we won't just send that out to anybody. We want to make sure the person we send it out to is reputable. Because if they screw that up, the seller's probably going to call us and say, mm -hmm. you guys. And we'll be like, uh, it was these guys, right? So it's kind of on us. You've got this moral, ob moral ethical obligation to make sure that what you negotiated on the seller finance deal actually ends up happening through the years. So we will hand right. shop those. That's awesome. Do you put properties on Craigslist or do any of that? Or are you guys strictly going off of your emails that, uh, of the list that you build? Most of the time it's emails in certain areas when we've actually bought properties to wholesale because we just, for whatever reason, we didn't have our buyer at the time. We're like, this is good enough. We just knew that we were going to sell it. Um, sometimes then we'll buy them and put them on a Craigslist, MLS Craigslist, and just try to get as much exposure as possible. But not very frequently. Most of the time we have we're certain we've got it sold before we, we buy it. Well, great. Well, Andy, I really appreciate you being on the show again. Lots of, of great info. And uh, if people listening want to reach out to you or contact you, is there a way for them to do that? Uh, yeah. Andy at I love real estate stories com. Or if you want to see what I'm about, if you want to see uh, the, the, the videos we're putting out, uh, go to YouTube, I love real estate stories or Andy McFarland. You can see us there. I'd love for you guys to make a comment, subscribe, uh, shoot me an email if you like something. Um, be cool. I like communicating people about that. Yeah, Andy's awesome. Shares a lot of info with people, and I appreciate everything he shared with me and uh, all of us on this podcast. So thanks a lot, Andy. All right, we'll see you. All right, take care. All right, that's the end of another great episode of the Flipping Junkie Podcast. A comeback for next week's episode where I've got Gloria Kelly from APIA Insurance. Uh, they're handling our insurance for our properties. Uh, we're going to talk about all the different things that in investors need to be aware of when, with regards to getting insurance for these properties, especially if they're vacant and you're doing work on them, uh, some of the ins and outs. I know a lot of investors uh, uh, aren't very sure about whether their policies are going to cover an issue with a property if it's vacant. And uh, so we're going to try to uh, make sure that everything is known through that episode. So check it out next week. Uh, and thanks a lot for listening to the podcast. And again, if you've got any questions about our real estate investor websites at leadpropeller.com or the real estate investor software system, reimobile.com, you can give us a call and we'll, we'd be glad to answer any questions at 210-999-5187. 210-999-5187. Hope you have a great week and see you next week.